So, um, next lap we're coming out. Happy spring. Let me know if you can't hear me. Uh, I'm using both hands. That's tricky. Um, a couple of things to be aware of. There's a handout, and um, it's got some resources, some links, and things like that. Also, if anyone would like the slides, feel free to send me an email. My email is on the handout, and I'll be happy to send it to you. A lot of people take notes or write down some of the URLs and that kind of thing, but if you just want me to send in the slides, I'll do that. Also, as we go through, um, if you have questions as we're going along, why don't you answer, ask them then. I think it's helpful for everyone else to kind of make sure that we're all staying on the same page and just get a chance to have a simple time. Um, that's it. So, let's get started. So um, we're going to talk a lot about some pretty heavy stuff today. College costs a lot, everyone knows that. But it does pay off. So the average college grad has about 46% less unemployment than high school grads on average. And college graduates earn about 65% more. So as you're thinking about all this stuff, if it seems kind of daunting, think about kind of the end in mind. And hopefully it will seem worth it. So what we're going to do tonight is talk about two main topics. One of them is deciding where you might get aid. And by you, I'm really talking about the student. And it's kind of a family thing. So parents and students can think about it, think about you as the you in that. And then the uh, other big piece of the puzzle is deciding what you can afford. So assessing where you might get aid. That really involves uh, help trying to create a match between the student and the college. So there are going to be two basic types of financial aid, need-based aid and merit-based aid. You want to understand your student's need profile and the student's merit profile, and then match the student's profile to how the colleges award financial aid. And if you can match those two things, you can kind of get to the sweet spot of having different pricing options or uh, cost options for college. Deciding what you can afford means making sure that you focus on the true cost of college, which is called the net price, and we'll talk about that a lot. It means thinking about the resources that you have available to pay for college, uh, thinking about how much you have to borrow if debt is going to be part of the picture, and then deciding if the amount of debt is reasonable and realistic. So we're going to talk about all of that stuff. So let's talk about the net price and the real cost of college first. And when people think about the cost of college, they tend to focus on these big numbers. These are the overall cost of attendance or the sticker price. So Bowdoin, everyone says, oh, did you know Bowdoin costs 65 or 70,000 a year? That's the sticker price. But it turns out that colleges award gift aid that helps to reduce the cost of college. And so the average amount of gift aid ranges from 6,000 at Ordo to 10 at USM to 41,000 at Bowdoin, which means that the students who are receiving aid end up paying, on average, somewhere between 11000 at USM, 24000 at Bowdoin, or 33000 at UNE. However, it turns out that not everyone gets financial aid. Most people, in fact almost everyone, at Orono and UNE gets aid, but only about half of the students at Bowdoin get financial aid. So that means that about half of the students there are paying that full sticker price. So when you figure out um, the real average net price for all students going there, it ranges from 13,000 at USM, 17 at Orono, 33 at UNE, to 40, uh, 46,000 a year at Bowdoin. So I'm not putting all these numbers up just to confuse you. They are confusing, but what I want to have you take away from this is that it's really important to focus on what your true cost of college is. It doesn't matter what colleges charge. What matters is what you pay. And 
And what you pay is your net price. The net price is defined as the cost of attendance, or that sticker price, minus the gift aid that your student is likely to receive at that college. So let's talk about the types of financial aid. And there are two basic categories. One of them is gift aid. This is free money. It's money that you receive to pay for college, no strings attached, you don't have to pay it back. And it's usually called either grants, which is typically referring to need-based aid, or scholarships, and that is typically referring to merit-based aid based on the student's academic profile. The other type of financial aid is called self-help. That's things like work study, so a job that a student gets during college to earn money, or loans that are taken out in order to pay the bill but have to be paid back after college. So gift aid reduces the cost of college, and self-help helps you manage the cost of college. Now obviously, gift aid is better than self-help, right? That makes sense. That seems pretty obvious, but it's not always as clear as it should be. So when colleges award financial aid, what they do is they send what's called an award letter. And this is a typical award letter. And it shows $22,200 in financial aid. But it turns out that this award letter is pretty typical, and it really is making it kind of difficult to figure out what the true cost of college out of the seven lines on this financial aid award letter, four of them are gift aid, two of them are loans, and one of them is work study. So, when you break them down by the different categories, it turns out that the gift aid is about $15,000. That's still a lot, but it's a lot less than $22,000, right? And there's still some important information that's missing. So what's missing, the starting price and what you're going to pay after you subtract the gift aid from the starting price. Well, I went online and I looked up what the starting price was for this college. And when you add up the various elements of cost, the starting price here was about $50,000. You subtract the gift aid and the net price, which is the true cost of what this college is going to cost this student for one year is just under 35,000 a year, okay? So keep this in mind, we're gonna come back to this towards the end, but first I wanna talk about the different types of aid and go back to that idea of how you can assess your profile for need and merit-based aid and then the college's awarding profiles. So gift aid, we said there are two types. One of them is need-based aid, typically called grants. And this is based most often on family income and assets. You apply for gift aid or for uh, need-based aid using the FAFSA form. You've probably heard of that. That's the federal financial aid form, and that's required at all colleges in the US. Many colleges also require a second form called the CSS Profile. Now there are about 2,500 four-year colleges in the US, and only about 150 of them use the profile. But the ones that use the profile tend to be more generous with need-based aid, and they tend to be the well-known um, colleges that you've probably heard of. So there's a good chance that you will end up dealing with the profile as your student goes through the financial aid process. Yes? So the question is about uh, when parents are divorced, how does the FAFSA work? And we'll talk about that. That's a special case in that question. Um, so merit-based aid is typically called scholarships, and that's going to be based on the student's grades, test scores, class rank, and often these are given out by the colleges almost automatically when the student is admitted to a college. However, there are a few different types of merit aid that require a separate additional application. 
application. So you always want to check on the college's websites, the financial aid, the financial aid portion of the website, and make sure you understand what's required to apply for as many different types of financial aid as you might qualify for, to be sure that you're not leaving anything on the table. So we're going to talk about need-based aid first. This is the algebra portion of the evening. Need has a specific definition in the financial aid world, and that is COA minus EFC equals your potential eligibility for aid. So that's what need is. It's your potential eligibility, not necessarily how much you might get. So let's break down the algebra. COA stands for cost of attendance, and that is made up of four elements, tuition and fees, room and board, books and supplies, and then transportation and other miscellaneous expenses. ESC stands for expected family contribution, and this is the most misleading acronym in the English language, because if you read what those words say in English, you think that's what you're expected to pay. But that's not the case. And in fact, almost everyone uh, pays more than the ESC, particularly if you're looking at colleges that award aid primarily based on need. College aid awarding policies vary a lot, ranging from colleges that meet full need. And you've probably heard about a lot of them. You go on college tours and they say, fill in your FAFSA, fill in your profile, and we meet full financial need. So we're going to talk about what, what that is a little bit more. Other colleges might award very little need-based aid. So if you have need and you're applying to a college that doesn't award need-based aid, that's not a great match of your student's profile with the college's awarding profile. If you want, you can go to this website and you can estimate what your ESC is. And knowing your ESC is helpful, but it's not enough. So what do I mean by that? It helps in a couple of different ways. Let's say that you go and estimate your ESC and it turns out to be 30000 Well, you're, that tells you that you're not going to get a nickel of need based aid at the University of Maine because University of Maine costs about $25,000. That's less than the EFC. So if you do the math, cost of attendance minus EFC, that's zero or below zero. There's no financial need. On the other hand, if you have an EFC of $30,000 and apply to Bowdoin, then you do qualify for need, and it's probably going to be a potential need of as much as $35,000 or $40,000. Another thing that knowing your EFC tells you is whether that need, your need profile is going to make college affordable if you have need met. So let's say, again, let's say that your EFC is 50,000, okay? If you take 50,000, which is the cost for one year, multiply it by four, assuming that your financial situation remains pretty stable over the course of the college years, that's $200,000. And if you do that and you say, I can't afford $200,000, then what that tells you is that a need-based, a college that relies primarily on need-based aid is unlikely to be affordable. Okay? Another thing to keep in mind about need is that every college defines its own idea of need, and it's hardly ever what your idea of need is. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about what goes into the EFC, because that, we said, is one of the things that determines eligibility for need-based aid. Just as there are two forms that you fill out to apply for need-based aid, there are two formulas. One is based on the profile, and one is based on the FAFSA. But they both use basically the same approach. And what that approach is, is to look at the income and the assets of the parents and the student. So when they're doing that EFC calculation, what's actually happening is there are four separate calculations going on in the background. They add up the results of all of them, and that 
total is the ESC. Yes. You say profile, you mean CSS? Yes, every time I say profile, I mean the CSS profile uh, when I'm talking about forms. Um, another thing that comes up frequently is that a lot of people will say my assets are going to kill me for financial aid. And in most cases, income plays a much bigger role in figuring out the EFC than assets do. So income is assessed using a set of tables that are comparable to tax tables. So it's a progressive system where they use one rate for a certain amount of income, and then a higher rate for the next certain amount of income, and so on. So the highest marginal rate that income is assessed at is about 47%. So once you reach that maximum amount, each additional dollar of income is going to add about 47 cents to the EFC. On the other hand, assets are assessed at a maximum rate of 5.64%. So the impact from an additional dollar of assets is only 5 cents. Okay? So assets for most people play a much smaller role than income does in the overall uh, calculation. All right, so let's talk about what goes into that, those four <coughs> calculations. The parent contribution from income. Okay, we're going to start and talk about the FAFSA first. So it starts with adjusted gross income. For 2017, that's the bottom line of page 1 of your 1040. For 2018, I think it's line 7. So whatever adjusted gross income is, is the starting point for figuring out the income that's being considered for financial aid. Then they're going to add certain items of untaxed income to it. Now the most common types of untaxed income are uh, tax-deferred contributions to a retirement plan. So for example, 401k contributions or IRA contributions that you can deduct from your taxes, those are going to be added back as untaxed income. And then the other most common type of untaxed income is child support payments that are received in the case of a divorced or separated family. Yes? Um, a question about child support. So child support ends when the child turns 18. And so when I'll be filling out the fact that she's 17. Yeah, that's a good question. So child support is going to end when the, when the student hits 18 in most cases. And what happens in those cases is you report what actually occurred during the year that they're talking about. So if they're asking for 2018 income, which is the income year that uh, current high school juniors will be using for their first year of college. And then if you expect your income to change, for example, because you're no longer receiving child support, you have to tell the colleges separately that your income is likely to be different. Okay? <clears throat> so once they add up adjusted gross income and untaxed income, they're going to subtract some very minimal allowances for basic living expenses and assess whatever is left over at an increasing marginal rate that caps out at about 47%. The profile is very similar to the FAFSA. All of the things that are considered for the FAFSA are also considered for the CSS profile, but in addition to that, they're going to include additional items of untaxed income. So untaxed Social Security, for example, is going to be added back for the profile, even though it's not counted for the FAFSA. Another thing that is added back for the profile are uh, tax losses that might appear on your tax return. So if you have capital losses from selling something at a loss, that's going to be added back. Or if you're a small business owner, they're going to add back the amount of depreciation or loss that your small business might have reported as, you, uh, as it went to your tax return. They're going to, um, again, subtract a certain amount of allowances, and then assess whatever is left over in a fashion similar to the FAFSA. So that's how the parent contribution from income is going to be calculated. 
Let's talk about the parent contribution from assets. So for the FAFSA, they're going to start with cash and investments. So cash is cash savings and checking accounts. Investments are things like mutual fund accounts, uh, stock accounts, uh, 529 accounts are an investment. Um, real estate that is not your primary home is going to be included as an investment. So if you have rental real estate or if you have a second home, that counts as an investment. For the FAFSA, your primary residence is not included as an asset. So that's an important thing to remember. Another thing that is not included as an asset, and this trips up a lot of people, is retirement accounts. So the balances in your 401k or your IRA are not counted as an asset in the financial aid formulas. Now a minute ago, I said that the contributions that you make during a tax year count as untaxed income. Now I'm saying that the asset balance doesn't count in the formula. And that's a little bit confusing, but it's 100% it's correct. So those payments that you make into an account during the year that's being considered do count as untaxed income, all right? And the reasoning behind it is that there's thinking that when you're close to college, you have discretion over deciding whether you're going to be funding your retirement or whether you're going to be using that money to pay for college. But once the money is actually in those accounts, it's no longer going to be counted as an asset. Okay. A couple of other, a few other things to remember that are not counted as assets are things like personal property. So your household furnishings, cars, boats, that type of thing, those are not assets for the financial aid formulas. And then they're again going to subtract a modest allowance and assess whatever is left at about 5%. The CSS profile is going to use a very similar approach. They're going to take all of the asset items that the FAFSA look at and then they're going to look at some additional items and include them as assets. And the biggest distinction that hits most people most commonly is the primary residence. So we said that your primary residence does not count as an asset for the FAFSA. It does count as an asset for the CSS profile. And what counts is the value of your home minus the mortgage debt that secures the home. Okay? Um, another thing that um, counts as an asset for the CSS profile are savings that you might have in the name of the student's siblings. So um, they're looking, they're trying to look at the overall family uh, picture. So they are going to include siblings' assets. After they subtract a modest amount for savings and retirement and so on, they're going to assess whatever is left in a fashion similar to the FAFSA. Okay? So that's the parent contribution from assets. Yes? 529 is including those that are grandparents, by the way? So that's a great question. 529 plans, how are those counted? So the FAFSA and the profile are looking at income and assets owned by the parents or the student, right? So if a 529 is opened by a grandparent and is owned by the grandparent, that's not going to be included. However, once you start taking money out of that grandparent-owned 529, the proceeds are going to count as untaxed income to the student because the grandparent's not included in the FAFSA formula, so the resource, when it comes out, is going to be counted as part of the formula. 529 accounts can be kind of confusing because they have both an owner and a beneficiary. And usually the student is the beneficiary. And in most cases, the parent or maybe the grandparent is the owner. Who reports it on the FAFSA the profile is the owner, except for one special case. And that is, if a 529 happens to be owned by a student, 
then it counts as a parent asset. So why is that important? Well, let's talk about the student contribution. The student contribution from income is going to be assessed very similarly to the way the parent contribution from income is assessed. The student contribution from assets, uh, the big distinction is that if there are assets owned in the name of the student, then they're assessed at a much higher rate. So we said that assets, when they're owned by the parent, are assessed at a maximum rate of 5.64%. But assets owned by the student are going to be assessed at 20 to 25 percent. So if you have $10,000 in the student's name, that's going to add $2,000 to $2,500 to the EFC. If it's in the parent's name, it's going to add about $500 to the EFC. And that's where that special loophole, where 529s owned by the students are counted as a parent asset could be important. Because if a student has $10,000 in their own name, if it's in just a regular checking account, that's going to count as a student asset. But if the student takes it and opens a 529 that's owned by the student, it's going to count as a parent asset and will have a much smaller impact on the ESC. So are, are these uh, calculations so the question is, are these calculations done each year during college? And the answer is yes. So if your student is a junior in high school, they're going to be looking at 2018 income for year one, 2019 for year two, 2020 for year three, and 2021 for year four. Okay, there are a few special cases. We've been waiting a long time for this one. <laughs> one of them is if there are multiple siblings in college at the same time, what happens is that the parent portion of that EFC calculation is going to be divided and shared among the siblings. So if your family planning was to have your kids pretty close, that was pretty good college planning. Congratulations. <laughs> Another special circumstance, and this came up before, is colleges are looking at a year that happened in the past when they're looking at the year for financial aid purposes. But what happens if your income changes after that year? Here's what happens. If your income is going to go down, so they're going to look at 2018 for your student's first year of college if they're a junior. If it goes down in 2019, maybe there's a death in the family, maybe there's a divorce, maybe there's a loss of a job or something like that, what you need to do is fill out the FAFSA and the CSS profile using the actual results from 2018 and then go to every college that your student is applying to and let each college know that your circumstances have changed and ask them to reevaluate your financial aid based on the new circumstances. What if you win the lottery in 20, uh, 2019 and your income goes way up? You get a pass, you don't have to report that. Okay. And the final special circumstance is divorced and separated parents. This one is tricky because the FAFSA and the CSS profile have very different approaches to how to treat divorced and separated parents. The FAFSA is going to look at the custodial parent, and if that parent has remarried, they will also look at the new spouse. The custodial parent, for financial aid purposes, is not the same as the custodial parent in a divorce decree, and it's not the same as the a uh, parent who claims the student on their taxes. The custodial parent for financial aid purposes is the parent with whom the student lived 50% or more of the time during the year, okay? Um, so that can present some planning opportunities. Um, if you both live in the same town, then it may be advantageous to have the student live with the parent that 
takes less income. If you live in different states and your student graduates from Freeport High School and you say, oh, my student lived with the parent who lives in Colorado, that might be a little bit of a tough sell. But uh, if you're in the same town, then you can think about who the student is going to live with. The profile is going to look at both biological parents, and if those parents have remarried, they will also look at the new spouses. So the profile may be looking at the income and assets of as many as four different parents when, it, when you uh, fill out those forms. Now the profile is going to do some calculations in the background that are intended to put the primary responsibility on the biological parents, but they will be looking at the income and assets of as many as four different people for the profile formula. Okay. So what we've talked about so far is how to figure out what your student's need profile is. Does your student have financial need? Now let's talk about how to match that. Let's say that you decide, yes, my student has financial need. How do you find colleges that might meet that need? This is a great website put out by the College Board, and it's got all kinds of information, including this paying for college section. And financial aid by the members is what I like to look at here. So at the University of Maine, they meet 69% of financial need on average. Okay? Now, out of that financial need that they meet, they meet about 49% of it with grants and scholarships. So remember we talked about gift aid and gift aid being better than self-help? So you can't just look at the amount of need that they meet. You want to know how much need do they meet with gifting. All right? At the University of New England, they don't publish their numbers on how much need they meet. And that's usually not a great sign if you have financial need. And in fact, the University of New England doesn't have great need-based aid. They do have a lot of merit aid. So if you don't have need and you want to look for scholarships based on students' grades and test scores, the University of New England might offer scholarships. But if you have need and you're looking for need-based aid, it may not be the best choice. BU meets 92% of need, and of that, about 75% of the need is met with gift aid, right? And then Colby, along with Bates and Bowden, is kind of the gold standard of a college meeting full financial need. They meet 100% of need, and they meet 90% of it with gifting. All right? So if you want to think about, if you've looked at these colleges, and you want to think about, on average, how much need-based aid might I get, you multiply the percent of need met times the percent of need met with gifting. So at Colby, 90% of need is met with gift aid. At BU, 92% times 75% equals 69% of need being met with gift aid. We don't know at UNA and at Orono, about 34% of need on average is met with gift aid. Now 34% at Orono doesn't sound that great, but remember that they've got a much lower starting cost. So for most people from Maine, or no, is going to be an affordable choice. And so every main student should be applying to at least one of the new main colleges. So these are averages. They give you an idea of where to look, but they don't tell you what it means for your bottom line. And we'll talk about how to find your bottom line a little bit later on. So that's a great question. So how is Colby's strategy of meeting 90% of needs sustainable? Um, remember when we were talking at the beginning, I said that at Bowdoin, 50% of the students were paying the full price. At Colby, it's a similar percentage. Well, what it is is 50% of the students don't have financial need yet. So they're paying the full price. And so when you average it out, they're making enough 
revenue. So that's actually a pretty big math question. Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> So that's a great question. So the question is, what about this claim that colleges make of being need blind? How is that sustainable? And in the short term, it's sustainable because the colleges that are need blind and meet full need have huge endowments that they can tap for those financial, uh, financial aid awards. Um, in the long run, that wouldn't be sustainable, but what happens is that you have, in, in fact, it's been in the news all the last week, you have legacy preferences, right? Legacy preferences are less likely to have as much need as non-legacy preferences, or institutional advancement candidates or something like that. Now, another thing to keep in mind about need blind, the opposite of need blind is need aware. Colby is need aware, which means that they don't have as much of an endowment as Bowdoin. Bowdoin is need blind, Colby and Bates are need aware. Colby and Bates don't have as large of an endowment. So what they do is, after they award enough aid so that they are going to run out of what their budget is, then they start favoring students who have the ability to pay. And that rubs people the wrong way, you know, because you think, geez, should it be like that? But in reality, I think that's a pretty responsible way of doing it. You might argue that maybe they could afford to do more, and, and I don't know the answer to that, but most schools in this country are need blind, and it's easy to be need blind if you don't meet full need. <laughs> if you are need, if you're need blind and you don't need full need, what happens is you might be like University of New England, where you're offering them admission, you're offering them some financial aid, but they may not really be able to afford it. So, that was a bit of an All right, so there are some myths in the financial aid world. One of them is the debt. A lot of people assume that debt is going to be factored into the EFC calculation. And the answer is, it usually is not. Unsecured debt is never in the formula. So unsecured debt is credit card debt or education debt. Um, anything that is not directly uh, securing an asset. And in fact, the only time debt is counted is if it's securing an asset that is included in the formula. So we said that for the FAFSA, the, your primary residence is not included. So your mortgage on your primary residence doesn't count as debt for the FAFSA. On the other hand, for the profile, when the primary residence is included, the debt against it counts against the asset value. Another myth is the savings myth. I talked about this a little bit before. People say, my assets are going to be included in financial aid, and that's going to hurt me for aid. And so they jump to the conclusion that it doesn't pay to save. I even had a guy who said, who told me, that his accountant said, if you can't save the full amount of college, don't bother to save a nickel. And that was horrible advice. That guy should not be an accountant. Because, if you don't save for college, the chances are you're going to have to borrow if you want to pay for college. And borrowing costs way more than savings. So let's look at the math. All right? Let's say that you have saved $100,000 for college. And let's say that your student gets into a college that meets full need and needs 100% of need with gifting. We know how rare that is because we just saw how few colleges meet 100% of need and how few meet with primarily gifted. But if you had that imaginary case, the maximum it could cost you is $15,000. On the other hand, if you don't save, you will have to borrow. And if you have to borrow $100,000, you're going to have to pay back $160,000. So $60,000 in additional borrowing costs versus $15,000, it always costs at least four times more to borrow than to save, and usually it costs a lot more than that. All right, let's talk about the dates for the FAFSA.
NASA and the profile. Those changed a few years ago, and if you have not had older children going to college, you don't really have to worry about it, but um, if you have, you might need to readjust. The year that's being counted as income is the year that took place two years before enrollment. So a student who's graduating from Freeport High School in 2020, they're going to look at 2018 income. So 2018 ended this past December 31st. You're filing your taxes right now. This fall, you're going to apply to college. And soon after you apply to college, you'll be able to file the FAFSA and the CSS profile. And that means that you'll be able to get your financial aid award in the uh, spring of the student's year that he graduates from college. Assets are valued as of the date that you file the financial aid form. Okay, so they're looking two years in the past at your income, but they're looking at your asset values as of right now. Okay. There's the filing facts that you have in the one year of enrollment, but there's also a filing two years before in order to know what that base year was, or does the filing look at the past two? So I'm not how, sure. How, how does FAFSA know about the two years before enrollment? Do we need to fill out the FAFSA two years before enrollment? Yeah, so no, no. Good question. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be confusing. So the question is, how does the FAFSA know what year of income to look at? And when you file, when you start the FAFSA process, it's going to say, when is your student entering college? So if your student is entering college in the fall of 2020, then the FAFSA is automatically going to go that it's looking at 2018 income. All right, so these, we talked a little bit about the uh, timing. Um, for high school juniors, 2018 will be the year that they look at for year one of college, 2019, 2020, and 2021 is going to be the year they look at for their senior year of college. We talked a little bit about what if grandparents have a 529, and I mentioned that it's not counted as an asset because it's owned by someone who's not the parent or the student, but the income from it does count as untaxed income to the student. However, think about those income years. The income year that's being looked at for the student's final year of college is 2021, which means that's the year that ends when the student is a sophomore in college. So if the grandparents use that 529 to pay bills after January 1st of the student's sophomore year, it's not going to be included as income because the FAFSA is no longer looking at that. Now that assumes that the student finishes college in four years, right? So, uh, and also it assumes that need-based aid is a factor. If you're not receiving need-based aid, you don't need to worry about when the grandparents use that 529, right? Because it might increase the ESC, but if you're not getting need-based aid anyway, makes no difference to your bottom line. Here's a table for sophomores, if anyone are parents of sophomores and ninth graders. So when should you file the FAFSA? The FAFSA and the CSS profile become available every year on October 1st. And you will hear most people encourage you to file early. And that's good advice in general, but there could be some tweaks. So for example, let's say that you pay estimated income taxes. Well, you might be better off to file your FAFSA and profile after you've made your income tax payment because it's no longer going to be in your checking account, so it's no longer going to be an asset. Or if you have a big bill that you need to pay. So, not advising you to go out and run up big bills, but if you, you know, if your boiler breaks and you need to fix it, then pay for it before you file the FAFSA. If a student is applying early decision, it's really important that you do file your FAFSA promptly. So early decision, uh, you might know about it, but I'll go over it quickly. 
Early decision is a way that students can apply to college early and get an admission answer from the college early. However, part of the bargain is that the student has to agree that if the college admits the student, they guarantee that they will come. Now there is an out, there is a loophole. If the college does not award enough financial aid for the student to afford college, then the student has the, uh, has the ability to break that contract. But you never want to be in that situation. If your student has applied early to college and gets into college, that you applied early to, and then you say, sorry, we can't afford it, that is the biggest bummer you can imagine. So don't, don't do that. Early decision is, in many cases, an advantage in terms of getting admitted to college. But it's usually a disadvantage in terms of financial aid. And the biggest reason is that if you're admitted early decision, you have to withdraw all of your other applications. And therefore, you're not going to get aid award letters from any other schools. So you're not going to have aid award letters to compare side by side. Now, a lot of early decision colleges have good estimators, which we'll talk about a little later, so you can get a pretty good idea, but you're always going to lose out on that ability to compare awards. You always want to check with colleges to make sure that they don't have any early deadlines that you might miss. We talked about filing when your asset values are low, and the way that colleges get the information on the FAFSA and the CSS profile is that you say on the form which colleges are going to get the information. They don't get it automatically. So what that means is that if you file early and then your student later decides, oh, there's another college I want to apply to, be sure you go back and revise the form to send that financial aid information to the new college. It's easy to do, but you don't want to forget. All right, so now we've talked about need-based aid. We've talked about how to, what goes into determining whether a student is eligible for aid, and we've talked about how colleges award need-based aid. Now we're going to go on and start talking about merit-based aid. And to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit first about the business of college, because colleges, in a way, are businesses. So when students and families think about colleges, they usually think about the admit rates. And they say, oh my god, Harvard is so hard to get into. Only 5% of students get admitted to Harvard, and BU only 25%. Well, colleges, of course, pay attention to that, but they also pay a lot of attention to what's called the yield rate. So the admit rate is the percent of students who apply to a college and who are offered admission to the yield rate is the percentage of students who are offered admission to a college who end up going in the fall. Okay? So at Harvard, almost, well, four out of five students who are offered admission to Harvard go to Harvard. Hardly anyone says no thanks. <clears throat> at BU, it's about 23%. And at Susquehanna and Ohio Wesleyan colleges, Susquehanna is in Pennsylvania, and Ohio Wesleyan is in Ohio, about 15% of students who have been offered admission end up going. When college yield rates get into the 20s or below, colleges really have to focus a lot on having enough students to come to the college so that they can get the tuition revenue that they need in order to pay their bills. And so what do they do? A lot of colleges discount with financial aid. They discount their price with financial aid in order to encourage students to come to that college. This final column is the percent of students who attend that college who receive college-funded gift aid from the college. So that question about how does Colby or Wesleyan or Bowdoin or Harvard sustain their full need policy. They only award to about half of the students, meaning that about half the students are paying the full price. 
At Northeastern, or well, at Muhlenberg College, 70% of the students who go get college funding gift aid. At Susquehanna, it's 98%. And at Ohio Wesleyan, 100% of students receive college funded gift aid. Right? Now, what this means is that if a college had, here's the takeaway, if a college has a relatively high emit rate and a relatively low yield rate and a relatively high percent of students who receive institutional college funded aid, then that's a candidate for colleges that award merit aid. So, merit aid is typically called a scholarship. The biggest factors that go into it are GPA, class rank, and standardized test scores. It's most prevalent at private colleges, but a lot of public colleges use merit aid too. And here's a key point. The highest awards go to the strongest applicants relative to the other applicants at the school. So what that means is that you may be likely to get the highest merit awards at schools that you might think of as your safety schools. And again, college aid policies vary, ranging from colleges that use zero merit aid or next to zero to colleges that use it extensively. So those full lead colleges like Bates, Bowdoin, and Colby use no merit aid. University of New England, which wasn't so great on need based aid, uses a lot of and transfers typically get significantly less merit aid than first-time uh, incoming students. So if your strategy is to start at one school and transfer to another, it might not be the best approach if you're thinking about merit aid. So let's look at a specific example. So Gettysburg College is in central Pennsylvania. Washington College is in Maryland, about 200 miles apart. The admit rates are very comparable, 46% at Gettysburg, 48% at Washington College, but the yield at Gettysburg is 25% and at Washington is 14%. So let's see what some of the aid awarding patterns are. The maximum award at Gettysburg is about 25,000 and that goes to students with a 1470 combined SAT score. So 1470 out of 1600. At Washington College, the maximum is about 23, and that goes to students with a combined SAT of 1320. And then they have lower awards, 10,000 at 1300 at Gettysburg, 13,000 at 1000 SAT at Washington College. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna layer on the 75th and the 25th percentile. The 75th percentile means that 25% of the students scored higher than 1410 on the SAT at Gettysburg, 25% of the students scored higher than 1300 at Washington College, and 25% of the students scored lower than 1270 at Gettysburg, 25% scored lower than 1090 at Washington College. And that institutional 8%, 78% at Gettysburg, 94% at Washington College. And it turns out that you can make a pretty good generalization from this, which is, if a college uses merit aid, the best chances for a large reward are when the student is in the up, above or close to the 75th percentile of applicants. If a college uses merit aid, it may phase out when you get to about the 25th percent of applicants, but colleges that compete for students aggressively may award merit aid to just about every student who they admit. Okay, so let's say that you have decided, you know what your student's merit profile is because you know their grades and test scores, Let's say that you're looking for colleges that might um, award merit aid. How do you do it? I'm going to show you a few resources. And one of them is College Navigator. And this is where I get all of that data about the admit rate, the 
yield rate and the percent of students who receive college funded aid. You can get the admit rate and the yield rate from a lot of different sources, but this percent receiving aid is not that commonly used. So this is where I found that Gettysburg gives it to 78% of students, Washington College gives it to 94% of students. So if that percentage of students receiving college-funded gift aid is above 60 or 65%, there's a good chance that, that school uses merit aid as part of its aid awarding approach. And if it's above 80%, then it's almost certain that the college uses merit aid when it's awarding its financial aid. So how about, what if you, what if you say you know what your student's SAT score is, and you want to find some colleges that might be candidates where your student might get merit aid? So let's look at an example. We're going to use an example of a student with an 1150 combined SAT score and see if we can find some colleges where this student might be at the upper end of the range where they might get merit aid. So I'm using US News and they've got these tables that show you the 75th and 25th percentile of the test scores. And at Shenandoah University in Virginia, that 1150 student is above the 75th percentile of 1123. And that's also the case at Suffolk in Boston, or Old Dominion in Virginia, or UMass Dartmouth. Now, even if you're not above the 75th percentile, if you're close, there's a good chance that you'll get a decent merit award if a college uses merit aid. So that includes University of Maine, Leslie in Cambridge, and Pace in New York City. So this is a way where if you know that you want to find schools that might offer merit award, that you can identify some specific schools that could award merit. This is a summary of, remember we've been talking about the student's profile for need and merit aid, and then the college's awarding profile. So this is a summary of college's awarding profiles. And I'm breaking it down into four categories, which I call elite, near elite, mid-market, and other. So the elites, no surprises, Stanford, Harvard, Brown, Amherst. The near elites are Colby, Bates, Connecticut College. And then most of the others are either mid-market or other. And the aid policy at the elite and the near elite colleges is that they tend to be a very high percent of need, and they tend to be a very high percent of that need with gift aid. The mid-market and the other colleges tend to gap. What gap means is that they don't meet full financial need. There's a gap between what your need is and what the college is offering. Um, and they do use some need-based aid, but it's not as generous as those uh, full need schools. On the other hand, the elite and the near elite use very little, if any, merit aid, and those mid-market and others use significant amounts of merit aid. There are about 80 or 100 colleges in this elite or near elite category, and there are over 2,000 in the mid-market or other category. So this is a good reason not to get too fixated on name brand colleges, but to have your student expand their search and consider a wide range of schools. All right. so, now we've talked, we've talked about need-based aid, we've talked about merit-based aid. Now let's talk about how you can figure out what it really means for you. Because up to this point, we've been talking mostly about averages. And what you really care about is what it means in terms of your bottom line, right? The way to do that is to use a tool called a net price calculator. A net price calculator is an online financial aid estimator it's required by law that every college have a net price calculator, but it's not required that colleges have a good one. Okay? So here's how you can tell the difference. 
If a calculator asks you three or four questions, it's a breeze to use, it takes you only 30 seconds, it stinks. If it's kind of a pain in the neck, if you have to look up numbers, if you have to kind of tear your hair out, then it's probably asking for enough information that it can give you a good estimate. And don't be discouraged because you'll find that maybe the first time you use it, it takes quite a while, but they all start to ask similar types of questions. So the more you use these enterprise calculators, the easier and the faster it's going to be to use them. Are there any um, systems where you can enter once and have a number of colleges use that information? Or do you do it for everyone? Um, so the question is, are there any systems where you can just enter your data once and have the colleges use it? Um, there's an imperfect system. So colleges that use a net price calculator that's sold by the college board have some functionality to reuse data, to save the data that you enter and reuse it. Most colleges, though, you can't. And it's, it's really not a big problem. It's not a big issue. So when you use a net price calculator, remember that more questions probably means more reliable, and the other big thing to remember is cost of attendance minus gift aid equals net price, because you always want to be zeroing in on what that net price is. And here's why. This is the output of the net price calculator. And I'm a numbers guy, but I must say that I do not find this very user-friendly. Right? But if you get to an output and you find it not so user-friendly, just remember those key things Net price is cost of attendance minus gift aid. Cost of attendance is tuition and fees, room and board, books and supplies, transportation and other. You subtract gift aid and get to net price. So don't be confused if they're throwing so many numbers at you that it seems kind of overwhelming. Just focus on what you really need to know to find out what the net price is. There's another myth, the net price calculator myth. So a lot of people think that they can't use a calculator until after they file their FAFSA or after they file their taxes. And that's not true, you can use it any time. And I like to think of it as a bullseye. So when your student is early in high school, if, you know, ninth or 10th grade, you don't know what their final grades are going to be, you might know, not know what your income is going to be, but you can ballpark it and kind of get an idea. And the closer and closer that your student gets to graduation, the better the information is, and thus the better the estimates that you are going to get are going to be. Now, if you want to be a net price calculator nerd like me, you can do this for any college that you want, okay? So this is a grid, and across the top of the grid, it shows different kind of academic uh, strengths, and along the side it shows different EFCs. And what I want to do using this grid is to zero in on one example. So I want to pick a B minus to B student with a uh, an 1100 SAT and an EFC of 15,000. And at Shenandoah in Virginia, this student is likely to get a merit award of about 10,000 and an additional 3,500 in need-based aid. Subtract that from their $45,000 cost of attendance, and you get a net price of 32,000 at Shenandoah for this particular student, okay? So when you're using net price calculators, what you wanna do is to compare costs side by side so that you can really see what the costs of the different schools that your student is considering are. And this is the point where I want to pause for a second because we've been talking about the money part of college, but there's more to it, right? Because, you know, your student is going to be living there for four years, your student has a certain field of study that they want to go for. So I'm not advocating that you are looking for the cheapest possible college necessarily, 
What I'm advocating for is that you understand what your costs are and you feel comfortable that after paying those costs for four years, you and your student will be in a good place. Right? That's really what you do with anything that you buy. You think about whether you want it, whether you can afford it, and if you can, then okay. All right, so let's look at this 15,000 EFC student, B minus B grades with 1,100 SAT. And at Roger Williams in Rhode Island, the net price is gonna be 42,000. At Shenandoah, 32. At Wheaton College in Massachusetts, 23,000. At Orono, 22. At Bowdoin, 17. And at USM, living at home and commuting, about 12,000. Now, I know that going to USM and living at home is not an apples to apples comparison to going away to college and living in the dorm. But I put that on there to remind people that there is an affordable path to college for everyone. Right? It might not be the one that you have been dreaming of, but there is an affordable path to college for everyone. <coughs> when you look at the other schools, Bowdoin looks pretty good at 17,000. But unfortunately, a B-minus student is not going to get admitted to both. And that's what that gray color means. On the other hand, Wheaton and UMO, they're all not too much more than both. So you know, maybe those are going to be good candidates for kind of a bargain for this student. All right, so now we've talked about need-based aid. We've talked about merit-based aid. And we've talked about how you can zero in estimate what your costs are going to be at any given college. Now I want to talk, and we're almost done, so thanks for having me on. Now I want to talk about how you go about paying for it. So the way you pay the net price is out of your income. And there are three kinds of income. There's prior income that you earned in the past and saved. There's current income, which is income that you earn during the college years and use to pay for college expenses. And there's future income, which is income that you earn after college and use to repay loans that you borrowed to pay for college while you were there. And when I'm saying you here, I'm talking about student and parents, right? Because College is viewed as a shared responsibility of the student and the parents. All right, so is the net price affordable? Remember that award letter we looked at at the beginning of the evening, and we found that that particular college was 34,000 for, or 35,000 for one year of college. But we know that the cost of a degree is going to take four years. So what do we have to do? We need to ask, how much are the costs going to increase? And, really important, we need to ask, is the aid renewable? Whenever you're talking to a college, you want to know, is the financial aid that they're talking about renewable? And what are the terms for renewing it? There are a few colleges, not very many, but a handful that award heavily to first-year students and then cut back. So if you make your plan based on paying the same amount year after year, that can be a problem. Most colleges don't do that, and most colleges are pretty upfront about it, but make sure you understand what the uh, requirements are. And also, when you're talking about merit aid, be sure that the requirements are realistic. So for merit aid, the way to renew it usually is to maintain a certain GPA in college. I talked to a girl today who was admitted to college and she needs to maintain a 93 average to keep her merit aid in college. That's tough. College is a lot harder than high school. So she's got to get an A starting, you know, right from the get-go, maintain it through college. 
So for this example, we're going to assume that costs increase 2% a year. We're going to assume that the aid is renewable and constant over four years. And we're going to assume that the student has $2,000 in savings and the parents have $25,000 in savings. So how do we pay for this college? Well, the total cost of a degree, when you add in the inflation, is going to be $145,000. Now we're starting to talk about real money. This student in their financial aid award got $1,800 a year in work study, and we're also going to take out federal student loans. If you have to borrow for college, the first place to go is always federal student loans. They have protections for the borrower if they run into trouble, they're guaranteed availability, and the interest rate is reasonable. However, there's a limit on how much you can borrow. The limit is $5,500 in year one, $6,500 in year two, $75 in year three, and $75 in year four. Okay, so after that, we're going to use the student's $2,000 in savings. And we're going to start with that because we know that student savings count more in the EFC formula than parent savings. So let's use those up, and maybe there's going to be an opportunity for a little bit more aid in years two, three, and four. We're also going to assume that the student works every summer before college and saves some money. So a student gets a job, $10 an hour, 40 hours a week, 10 weeks during the summer. They earn $4,000, they pay taxes, they go to Old Orchard two or three times, and they should still have $2,000. After that, the parents are going to look at their budget, and they're going to say, we think that out of our regular monthly income, we can pay $375 a month for college expenses while the student is in college. That adds up to $4,500 per year. After that, we're going to use the parent savings. And if we use $19,000 of that parent savings, we have fully paid for year one of college. So that's good. We still got years two. So we're going to use the remainder of the savings. After that, we've used up prior income and current income. So we've got to borrow more. We've got to use more future income in order to pay the balance. That's going to be about 15,000 in year two, 21 in year three, and 22 in year four. The good news is that we have fully paid for college using prior income, current income, and future income. We've ended up with student debt of $27,000 and parent debt of $58,000. Now, some people might say it's the student who's going to college, so it's the student's responsibility for the entire amount of the debt. And that's okay, however, your student is 18 years old, has no job, no collateral, no credit history. So no one's going to lend that student money unless there's a cosigner. And that's why, and that's usually the parent. So that's why I always say that this is a parent liability. Even if the student is planning to repay it, the parents are on the hook for it. So they should be ready for that. All right. So we said 27,000 in student loans and 58,000 in parent loans. Is that a good idea? We don't know yet. And what do we need to know to find out? The first thing is what will the loans cost? So it turns out that student loans cost 5%, parent loans cost 7.6%, and they are paid off over 10 years after college. What that means is that that interest rate and that repayment term, for every $1,000 of student debt, the student has to pay back $128 per year. For every thousand of parent debt, the parents have to pay back $143 per year. So, with 27,000 in student debt, 27 times 128, is 3444. So the, the student is going to have to pay back $3,444 per year for 10 years after college to pay off 
for 27,000. The parents are going to have to pay 58 times 143, or about $8,300 a year to repay that debt over 10 years after college. So that tells us how much it's going to cost to repay the debt. It doesn't yet tell us whether it's reasonable or not. And how do we decide that? We've got to think about what the income is, how much are the students and the parents earning, and how much of a burden is it to repay those education loans. So the rule of thumb that I use is that you should try to keep education debt repayments at not more than 10% of income. Okay? If you've got 90% of income that you can use for taxes, car, rent, and so on, then hopefully that's um, good. It, it is for the student, it may not be for the parent. So for the student, with 27,000 in student debt, 3,400 a year, that student needs to get a job after college that pays about 35,000 a year in order to keep the debt payments less than 10% of income. And the good news is that a new college graduate on average makes about 40,000 now. So it's a good bet. I think that a student borrowing $27,000 for college is not a bad deal in most cases. For the parents, it's more complicated because the parents may have other obligations that they have to pay for. They may have other children that they have to help with college expenses for, and they're at least 20 years closer to retirement than the student is, and they've got to start thinking about that. And in this case, I see a red flag. Here's what it is. When we were looking at how this family was going to pay for college, we said that the parents looked at their budget and decided that they could pay $375 a month $4,500 a year. So if they can pay $4,500 a year during college, what makes them think that after college they can pay $8,300 a year? That's, that's, a, that's a problem. Okay, so what do you do with all this information? Once you do this, you can see what the four-year cost of college is at a range of different colleges. And you can figure out what your zone of affordability is. And once you figure out what your zone of affordability is, any college that costs less than that, you know is going to be affordable. When I look at someone, I usually try to find out what their parent-free debt point is. That's probably going to be an affordable place for the parents. Even if the student borrows $27,000, if the parents don't have to borrow, then they can pay for four years of college and then move on and take care of everything else that they need to. So these are the factors that the parents need to think about, what their savings are, what they can pay for earnings during college, what the debt service is going to be after college, what their other commitments are, kids and retirement. So a lot of people say, well, you know, this is all great, but I'm going to apply for a lot of scholarships to help pay for college. And I say that that's a great idea. However, you have to remember that the vast majority of gift aid to pay for college comes from the colleges themselves. So when you apply to all of those scholarship funds for outside scholarships, it's definitely great. If you get $500 or $1,000 or $2,000, that's real money. But that's what you're likely to get. Very few people get much more than $2,000. We'll just wait until I'll pay for college. So another question that I get asked a lot is, how does everyone else pay for college? And the answer is exactly the way that we've talked about tonight, all right? So the student automatically has $43,000 to pay for college. $2,000 a year in work study, $2,000 a year in a summer job, times four, that's 
plus 27,000 in federal student loans. So if you're gonna pay more than 43,000, then you've got to have either a cheaper college, a college with a lower net price, which means a different college, one that either starts with a lower starting cost or awards more in gift aid to you. So you've either got to find a lower net price or you've got to have more resources available, which means more savings from the students or the parents or more income that the parents pay out of their monthly check or more parent debt. And unfortunately, I think a lot of it comes from that more parent debt category. So when they talk about a student loan crisis, I think that it's kind of a parent loan crisis a lot of times. So let's keep things in perspective. College is important, but it's really not the goal, right? The goal is to set up your kids so that when they get out of college, they're going to be able to succeed in whatever they want to do with the rest of their lives. And I often see kids who go through the stages of grief. When I talk to parents and you look at what the numbers are, they usually get to the acceptance phase pretty fast. But for kids, it can be harder. And so it's really helpful if you start including your kids in these affordability conversations early, like when they're a junior. You know, and, and you'd like to, and, and it's, it's tough. Because kids have, been, have gotten this message, if you work hard in school, you can go to any great college. But the fact is, college costs money, and we're all constrained by budgets. So some good news, the guy who founded Starbucks did pretty well for himself. He went to Northern Michigan University. The head of Walt Disney went to Ithaca College. And Gilead Science, the head of that big biotech company, went to Ohio Wesleyan College. They all did pretty well, and they didn't go to an Ivy League school. Another way to look at it is Syracuse, Northeastern, Ithaca, and Ohio Wesleyan. The mid-career average difference in pay between the highest and the lowest in them is $700. But the average difference in, uh, the maximum difference in the net price is over $55,000. So paying a higher net price doesn't necessarily mean automatically that you're gonna get that paid back in terms of future income. So, finding financial safety. People talk about safety colleges a lot. Financial safety is a good thing to look for, too. So there are a couple of approaches that you can take. One of them is to use the numbers, like we've talked about tonight. Think about whether you have financial need, and if so, can you uh, find colleges that might award need? Or if need is not going to be the way that you are able to solve your college funding problem, maybe merit aid. So you look for those schools with relatively high admit rates, relatively low yield rates, relatively high percent of students aiding. A way to kind of shortcut that, if you don't want to use, if you don't want to do all the number crunching, is seed your list with different types of colleges. So every student should apply to one of the University of Maine schools. That's the no rate. And then, depending on what their profile is, they might want to think about other categories of colleges. So, Keene State, that's a nice college in New Hampshire. They've got a relatively slower starting price, and they've got some merit aid. Um, if merit aid is what's going to be important, this Colleges That Change Lives has a list of colleges, and many of them use quite a bit of merit aid. So use these as kind of resources. There are a ton of um, federal tax benefits for education. We don't have time to talk about them, but this um, publication has got information on all of them. And the one to look up first is American Opportunity Tax Credit. That's a, that's a really good Last thing I want to leave you with. Maine resident 
students can get $300 free every year by funding a next-gen account through the state of Maine. So we talked about outside scholarships. And I have people all the time who say, oh, I'm going to apply for this scholarship or that scholarship. And it drives me crazy when there's free money and all they have to do is save a little bit to get that free money. It's a sure thing. So it makes sense to do it. And even if your student is a junior right now, if you start saving, by the time you're a senior in college, you'll have $1,000 in free money and you'll also have a couple thousand dollars in savings that you can use to avoid borrowing. So that's the end of what uh, I wanted to talk about. Hopefully this is helpful for everyone. Anyone who wants the slides can email me. My email is on the handout. I've also got a website with some resources, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any that so thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, I know Bill usually stays for a few minutes after. And